James E. Rohr is the chairman and chief executive of the PNC Financial Services Group, one of the largest diversified financial services companies in the United States. Rohr joined the company through its management development program in 1972. He was recruited right out of college. He proceeded through various marketing and management responsibilities in several corporate banking areas, including lending, treasury management services, and merchant banking. He was elected vice chairman of PNC in 1989, named the director in 1990, and elected as president in 1992, and named chief operating officer in 1998. Rohr was named chief executive officer in May 2000 and chairman in 2001. For his leadership of PNC, Rohr was named American Banker, Banker of the Year in 2007. He also just conferred with me that they're uh, one of the highest performing bank stocks. Roy is a director of Bla BlackRock Incorporated, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, Allegheny Technologies Incorporated, Equitable Resources Incorporated, and Rand Board of Trustees. He's a past chairman of the Pennsylvania Business Roundtable and is involved in other industry groups, including the Inter International Monetary Conference and the Financial Services Roundtable. He's also a director and former chairman of BITS, the technology group for the Financial Services Roundtable. In addition, Rohr serves on a number of civic, cultural, and educational organizations. He's chairman of the Allegheny Conference on Community Development and immediate past chairman of the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. He is a board member and former chairman of the Greater Pittsburgh Council of the Boy Scouts of America. He is a director of the Committee Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy, Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Pittsburgh's McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and is a member of Notre Dame's College of Business Advisory Council. In October 2006, Rohr received the Woodrow Wilson Award for Corporate Citizenship. In May 2007, he received the Sesame Workshop Corporate Honorary Award, and in May 2008, he received the Woman's Institute for a Secure Retirement Hero Award from the Heinz Family Philanthropies. He just uh, told me they have the largest number of green banking branches, if any bank, in the U.S., and um, working on putting the first platinum office building in Washington, D.C., Rohr earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree in economics in 1970 from the University of Notre Dame and his Master's in Business Administration from Ohio State University in 1972. He lived in Farley and then in Lyons. He was here before women were. He said the only thing that was better back then was the football team. So, things have changed. It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Uh, James E. Rohr. Thank you, George. Thank you very much, George. Thank you. Uh, I think the class is about over now. <laughs> it's now our 20-minute introduction. It's great to be here. I, uh, it's a fascinating time for all of you to be in, in business school today to watch all the change. Uh, but uh, it's great for me, actually, to be back here, which is really home for me. Uh, it's it's amazing to see the snow. We don't get much snow in Pittsburgh, but I, you know, I remember the snow very well. The four years my father went here, my brothers went here, uh, and it's really a place. Actually, my brother is coming in from Hawaii uh, tomorrow morning to to watch the game, so he'll be a mess. A nice thin blood <laughs> won't keep him out there very long. But it's a great place. It's a it's a wonderful place, and it's been been awfully awfully good to me. I, I have to say that I am amazed to see. Uh, this many people show up in a foot of snow uh, on a Friday. Uh, our group probably wouldn't have done that. I was in Lions Hall. We had the fellows from Carroll Hall. We used to just kind of stop in our room, and after they'd stopped for a while, then we didn't get to class all that often. But anyway, we, we got there often enough. Uh, but it's great to have you here today. Uh, one of the things that I would like to to do, if you could, is, is to have a conversational meeting. And I know it's impossible to have a, a conversation with a couple of hundred people. But 
I've got some slides and some things to talk about, but uh, it's a very, very interesting time. It's the most, at least from a banker's point of view, it's the most remarkable time I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like this. It's totally new and uncharted territory for all of the bankers, and I've been in the business, as George said, for 37 years, uh, and it's truly, truly remarkable. And what I'd like to do is, is at least come away with uh, having accomplished some things for you in terms of what you would like to get out of hearing from a bank CEO today. And I, I, I'd like to know what, what those might be. What, so if I could just spend two or three minutes asking a question of you before we get started. What is it that you would like to learn or take away from this class um, before, we, before we get started? And I'll try and touch on it somewhere in the middle. You're sitting right up front. Do you have anything? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have, have something they want to get out of this class? Yes, sir. Pardon me? Okay. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim, uh, uh, Senator Chris Dodd of Connecticut has really been hard on bankers lately about not properly using the bailout funds. Uh-huh. Talk about that, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The, uh, the role of National City and future mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. We have some National City folks here. Could they raise their hands, please? We got away up, brother. Hey, welcome aboard. It's great to have you, partners. Well, not quite partners. December 31st. December 31st. I think we're signing the S4 today, so we'll be a, hopefully knock on wood. We'll be okay. Anybody on this room care to learn anything? Yes, sir. I wish I knew that exactly, but we'll we'll try to talk about it a little bit. Anything else? Okay, that's good enough. Hopefully we'll get, the, there's also some things that I hope we get to ask some questions about in terms of what is it like to be in a boardroom during good times and bad governance. And then also, what is what will corporations be looking for as we as we come out of this, uh, as we come out of this initiative? And you as... You as students, what might you, what might you think about when you're going and looking for, for a new job? So I think uh, we'll, we'll try and touch on, on all of those. Let me let me take you back a little bit into the 90s. I know it's a long time for you, but it wasn't so long ago. And in the end of the 90s, everything was growing at 20% a year, right? Wasn't that a wonderful time? Stock market was going up 20% a year, so you really didn't have to do anything else. You were getting wealthier every single day. That was a wonderful halcyon time. And my wife became a, became a day trader, as a matter of fact. Every day I would come home and she would say, I made 15,000 bucks today. So what did you do? She said, I bought XYZ at 2 and it went to 7. I said, really, what do they do? She said, I don't know. I think they're in communications. I said, well, what is their PE? She said, PE was a thing of the past. It's a concept no longer being used. You know what? She was right. And like a lot of things in life, they're right until they're not. And when they're not, they're really bad. And so comes 2000, by the way, I will tell you, I can remember that wonderful month in April of 2000, which was the peak of the Dow, right? Peak of the Dow, peak of the NASDAQ. After that, it went straight down, something nobody thought could happen. And it collapsed. The NASDAQ went down 80%, the Dow. You know how I remember that month? That was the month I became CEO. That was the month I really respected my predecessor. <laughs> he knew right when the hell to get out. <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't have another venture capital game for five years. But in any event, timing is everything. And remember that timing is, uh, timing is everything. But I think it's a, it's a very important thing when we, when we talk a little bit about how we got into this mess. And, uh, and then we can talk a little bit about the economy and how we get out. So, See if we get this right here. Where are we today? We, from as a banking business, we're in an unbelievable bad place. 
We have the economy declining. We've got an absolutely frozen capital markets industry. We have banks that are trading at all-time lows. We had liquidity in the 90s and in the early 2000s when Fed funds were won that everybody could borrow at LIBOR plus a quarter. With a return like that, you were better off buying your stock back. You got a better return. So what did banks do? They bought their stock back, and they came into this economic downturn with the lowest capital ratios they ever had. Also, we had the accountants come and tell us that you cannot build reserves during difficult times. Cannot build reserves during difficult times. That is what you would call managing earnings. And so the banks came into this downturn with the lowest level of reserves that they ever had. So the sector really came in totally unprepared for what might happen. We are in an unbelievable storm. So the Citibank at $5. You've lost Bear Stearns. Come very close to losing Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley trading at $9 a share today. Many banks trading in single digits. Bear Stearns is gone. Merrill Lynch is gone. The capital markets are such. I had dinner with John Thane, the chairman and the, and the president of uh, Merrill Lynch, Greg Fleming, on a Thursday night. On Friday morning, the market lost confidence in Merrill Lynch. Their collateral was pulled. Their lines were pulled. And by Friday afternoon, Merrill Lynch was broke. And on Saturday, it got sold. We're not talking about Sam's dry cleaner here. I hope Sam, there's no Sam that has a dry cleaner. We're not small, talking about small business. We're talking about a company that had been in business for 100 years. The largest broker in the world disappeared in 24 hours. It happened in AIG. Quite frankly, we had the same situation. AIG is the most complicated financial company maybe in the world. Had their collateral lines pulled. They got downgraded. They got a $70 billion cash collateral call on Wednesday morning, and the government had to lend them the money so that they didn't collapse. We are in a really unique time. Lehman Brothers was liquidated and went bankrupt. It is being liquidated. It's been a very difficult time. There is no capital markets. We haven't had a securitization of a student loan since a year ago, August, because they don't know how to price them. So it's a very, very difficult time. But quite frankly, we'll get through this. A lot of it is tied to housing prices. A lot of it is tied to housing prices, and we'll show you some things about housing prices. And and we can talk about what it's like to be a CEO in this business. The bank's asset quality continues to deteriorate. We're in a slowing economy. CNI loans will get worse. But the worst part about it is the consumer portfolio, and we'll talk about that in a second. Capital levels, as I said, they came in with an all-time low. Still struggling with capital levels. The volatility is at an all-time high. There's nothing that we have a whole... There's a bunch of charts that anybody can look up on Bloomberg. Regulatory, regulators are trying to figure out what they did wrong. Our regulatory system was built upon a strategy that was put together as a result of the Depression. There's no real understanding of counterparty risk. There was no real understanding of derivatives and credit default swaps. There's no regulation for those kinds of things. Hedge funds. Uh, really kind of changed, changed, and we really didn't have regulation over, and still don't, over many of them. Uh, monetary policy changes, I think you're going to continue to see a declining interest rates from the Fed, but the Fed's, Fed funds rate is at one, and all of the spreads in the marketplace are wide, at their all-time wides. So it's, it's, uh, it's the fact is there are really no easy answers. We'll get through this. We've gotten through it before. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'll tell you a little story. I was with Tom Broca uh, about two weeks ago, and we were talking about how difficult the economic times are. And Tom has just written a book called Boom about the 60s. That's back when I was in school. And he said, remember in 1968, we shot a national hero, Martin Luther King. We shot Bobby Kennedy. We were actually killing our uh, presidential candidates. We had riots in the streets. We had students. I remember it when I was here. We had, it was really kind of a good thing in a way. We, we didn't have to go to class if you didn't want to. It was a good thing. Anyway, 
Students were, were, were not, were protesting all over the country. And we actually had a war. There was a multiple of the war, Iraq, where we're in now, and we were losing it militarily. And so times in the 60s were very tough, and the 70s became fine. And so he, he was very interesting in saying, Doug, we will get through this economic turbulence. It'll just take some time, and it's going to take some hard work, and it's going to take some pain. But we'll get through it. Let me tell you about the banking business. The yield curve here. In pick a date, 2004, we had a very steep yield curve. Fed funds were at 1%. You look at the green lines, I think you get that. Fed funds was at 1, and mortgage rates were actually at 8. These, these lines are treasuries. And so mortgage rates were at 8. You can see the, the uh, treasuries were at 5.5. Mortgage rates were at 8. What you could do then, now remember, we're having a declining economy. The stock market is falling. You're cutting costs. And so what you could do is you could put an 8% mortgage on your books and fund it at Fed funds. What's that called? What's that called? Customer business? It's called interest rate risk. You're putting a 30-year asset on your books, and you're funding it overnight. It's not the right thing to do, but it's interest rate risk. People put enormous amounts of interest rate risk. The spread business, remember, the average bank in the United States has two-thirds of their revenue comes from spread. Two-thirds of their revenue. In Europe, it's three-quarters. So the spread business is real important, right? It's just your predominant revenue. You put on 8% mortgages, fund them overnight, it's like heaven. You get this huge spread. It's lovely. And actually, securitizations of mortgages went down 35% because banks, quote, put them on their books as customer business and generated earnings growth. Okay, now what happens? Fast forward two years forward. You have a flat yield curve. Your 8% mortgages get prepaid. They're down to 7. They're actually down to 6.5. So your revenue stream on your asset side goes down, and Fed funds goes from 1 to 5 and a quarter. What's that called, huh? That's three quarters of your revenue is getting squeezed. Every month, you have a CD rolling off. It's 2%. You replace it at 4. It's not fun. You're getting squeezed on your costs and your revenues. And so what did we do? You see, what we did is we went out what's called the credit curve. You can't go out the yield curve anymore. It's flat. So we go out the credit curve. We change our credit criteria. And so in two and a half years, and you see these charts here, in two and a half years we find seven times as many qualified subprime borrowers as we ever found before. Subprime went from 3 to 23% of the mortgage business in two years. Why? Because there was spread, and I could get that spread and replace the spread that I was losing because of the loss of the, what we called the carry trade. And somebody said, uh, somebody told me, he said that, that uh, subprime is a lot like a married guy with a girlfriend that it's really fun until it's not. And then you lose your house and your car and all your friends, and that's basically what happened. And I'll show you some other charts. The other thing we did, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the collater collateralized debt obligations on the right, what we did is we made two funny assumptions. One funny assumption was that housing prices would always go up, and secondly, liquidity would always be there. So it really didn't matter what kind of credit criteria you use because you could always get bailed out by the price of the house. Anyway, it was right until it wasn't, right? It was right for a long time. We take these these mortgages, these collateralized, create collateralized debt obligations, and we put them together and sell them to people. And the Europeans own almost half of them, by the way. They're still struggling. <coughs> RBS today, trillion dollar bank selling in the pence less than a dollar a share. So we did a lot of that. Here you can see what's happened with home inventory and sales. Uh, this is the biggest housing inventory we've ever had in the history of the United States. You can see housing starts absolutely plummeting. What we did is we financed a whole bunch of people and paid for their houses that couldn't afford the houses. 
It's not complicated. And what happened? Oh, this is one other thing. Another place you could go to replace spread. Leverage loans. So all these leverage buyouts. What you did, and it was kind of funny in hindsight, all these private equity geniuses. We're all geniuses. What I would do is I would, George, you and I would get make a deal that I would buy, I would buy Tom Bloom's company. And I'd, I'd leverage it four to one, four dollars worth of debt to one dollar worth of equity. But the market loosened up. And so George would buy it from me and he'd lever it five to one. And George would let, let it sell it to you and lend it at five, six to one. We all know how this works. Actually, in 2002, 2003, the standard leverage ratio for a, for a highly levered transaction was three and a half to one. In 2007, in the spring, it peaked out when the bubble blew up. Sally Mae was to be levered at nine to one. We changed our credit criteria to fill the hole of, that we got from the collapse, from taking too much interest rate risk, and that we tried to replace with credit risk. That market has been totally closed for a year and a half now. You can't syndicate a highly levered transaction to save your life, and the average portfolio today would be trading at about 82 cents on the dollar. Massive losses in the portfolio if the company's performing. If it's not performing, that's another issue. Write downs. Oops. These numbers are actually now old. As a matter of fact, the uh, Every day that I delayed coming here, the number gets bigger. The, uh, the global number is now over 800 billion uh, and growing rapidly. And frankly, unless they change some accounting rules between now and the end of the year, uh, this number will quickly go over a trillion, a trillion dollars. Uh, we just let money to people who couldn't pay it back. And uh, it, is, it is very, very painful. My wife was, uh, was asking me, where did the money go? I said, You're, these greedy bankers in New York. I said, yeah, they got some of it. She said, well, where did it go? I said, you're not going to like the answer. She said, what do you mean? I said, it went to plumbers. It went to carpenters, electricians. We built literally hundreds of thousands of homes that people couldn't pay for. Banks lent them the money. They built the houses, and then they defaulted. And that's what's resulted in these losses. At PNC, let me tell you a little bit about PNC now before we go into the Q&A. Let's see how I... How do we do this? Okay, how do we get the other slide back up when I'm finished with this beauty? Local PC. Local PC. Okay, now what happened to it? Is it still there? No, it's gone. Jazz, you're trouble with the document camera here. Okay, never mind the document camera. Let's go back. Oh, there it is. It's back now. No, now it's gone. Oh, there it's back. Look at this. Who understands this? Thank you very much. <laughs> Who understands this? Uh, just a, a description. This is my description of PNC. We'll have a test on this later. Uh, PNC, at PNC, we have four constituencies we care about. We have four constituencies we care about. We think it's absolutely critical to the success of the company. The S up in the corner are the shareholders. Very important. You don't, if the shareholder doesn't win, you don't win, you don't get to play anymore. That's very, very critical. This year we've been the number two performing bank for shareholders. The last three years and the last five years we've been number one. The last two years we've been number one. And since the National City announcement, we've been number one. So we're pleased, to, we're very pleased about that. We performed well for our shareholders. You gotta be careful of this. We're down 22% for the year. Somebody said, somebody said, you're the best boat in the hurricane. Good news is you're the best boat. Bad news is it is a hurricane. Uh, on the right, the customers. The customers pay all the bills. We measure ourselves by customers. The E is employees. We measure ourselves quarterly by how well we're doing for our employees and our employee satisfaction numbers. And the COM is communities. We measure ourselves every single month. Our customer satisfaction numbers have gone up three years in a row. 
I'm very pleased about that. And we also put in innovation for new products, and we can talk about virtual wallet when we finally get bring it to we finally bring it to South Bend. Employee satisfaction has gone up. We won the Working Mother Award for the last four years in a row. We care about flex time. A lot of our, most of our employees are women. A lot of them are working mothers, so we spend a lot of time making sure that our managers have the ability to provide that flexibility for people who need it. We also we also have the perhaps the single most expensive or one of the most expensive 401k plans in America, which is very important to us. We match dollar for dollar for up to 6% of your pay. So it's a very, very important to us uh, that we do that. Communities, fourthly, are extremely important to us. We think as a bank, you have to you only do as well as your communities do. We've committed to our banks, uh, to our communities. Uh, last year, this year, actually, we were the number one company in America, large company in America, uh, as awarded by the Committee for Corporate Philanthropy. Uh, <clears throat> two of the components of that, one is we have a thing called Grow Up Great. It's a $100 million commitment to early childhood education. Our, we have 6,000 or 25% of our current employees volunteer time. We actually pay them. We've been recognized by Sesame Street, the Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Committee on Corporate Philanthropy. And George was nice enough to mention that we have more green buildings than any other company in the world. We have the largest green operating building. Green Branch is trademarked by PNC. And we were building the, we're building the first platinum green building and office building in Washington, D.C. So communities are very, very important to us. At the bottom of this, there's a T that you can't see, and that's technology and innovation. If you're not involved in technology and the innovation business, you're out of business. We've been named the number one, one of two, the top 100 companies, only two banks have made the list of the top 100 companies in America for technology by CIO magazine. So that's <coughs> something about PNC. The other thing I'll tell you is we're a $145 billion bank. We're acquiring a $150 billion bank, which is National City. We'll be merging with them at the end of the year, which will create, create the fifth largest deposit franchise in America. And we are extremely excited about, uh, about this combination. I think it's going to be really, really spectacular. With that, let me go back uh, quickly to the laptop, right? Local PC. All right, local PC. There we go. These are the things that help us get here. I'm not going to read these to you, but they've worked out very, very well. We've been disciplined, more disciplined than our peers. We're about 60% fees because of all the businesses we have that are fee-oriented, that we cross-sell to our customers, so we're not as dependent upon net interest income as others. It's worked out very, very well for us. And we've avoided, we made a decision in 1998 not to do subprime, and that turned out very well for us. And we sold our mortgage company in 2002, which was good timing for that as well. But uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a good year for us. These are concerns. Let me talk to you. Someone said about housing prices. We look back at 1990. Housing prices bottomed out 12 to 24 months after foreclosures peaked. <coughs> foreclosures haven't peaked yet. So we've got a ways to go. The Federal Reserve says that we have another 10 to 15 percent to go in, uh, in uh, housing prices decline. And uh, it's probably going to take us another... <laughs> You know, 12 to 18 months, I would think, before it bottoms. That's very important in the capital market space because the loss component of a mortgage-backed security is the key component to pricing all public debt. Because if you can't figure that out, then you don't know the interrelationships, and so it just doesn't work. You'll see the rest of this coming. And I think uh, you've, read, you've read all about this. Bank of America just made a, a credit card announcement about troubled credit cards, as did, uh, as did uh, Citibank just the day before yesterday. These are things I think that will help us a lot. Uh, the regulators are doing a lot. It, real interest rates are very low to the extent that we can stabilize the, uh, the securitization market and you can borrow. 
Inflation is headed lower. Who paid less than $2 for gasoline? Yeah, pretty good, huh? Who paid more than $5 for gasoline? Yeah, that wasn't any fun either. So it's, uh, it's really good. And I think you'll see uh, the, the, the intervention uh, continuing to come to stabilize the markets. And I'll leave these up because these are some of the things that I want you to remember in terms of being students. Now, what would you like to know about the TARP program? You had a TARP question? Yeah, the question was that I was listening to Chris Dodd uh, this morning on NPR. He was really hammering the banks, saying the banks have misused the bailout funds that had been provided. Basically, he says they're hoarding the funds and they're not lending them out as intended. They're using these funds to acquire other banks as well as hoarding the funds. And he says that Congress in the next session will have to take action uh, if the banks don't shape up their bank. You know, for a fellow that voted for the TARP, it's kind of interesting how he retrades history, and it's only been a month or two. Uh, Congress is very interesting, but we won't get into we won't get into how that works. Uh, the, if the, I must admit, TARP was sold on a basis that really didn't it made a lot of sense, but then they bait and switched. I better take that back. Please erase that. They didn't bait and switch. They just kind of changed their momentum. We had an issue. We have, I mentioned how frozen the securities market is. The Secretary of the Treasury came out and said we have to unfreeze these markets, and as a result, we need to buy some of these securities that have huge liquidity premiums built on them so that we can, we can get the markets flowing again. What happened was is that it takes a long time to get that machinery in place. He actually went to the Congress with a 30-page document for the TARP, came out with a 440-page bill. It included some money for automobiles. It included some money for a park in Idaho. It included a whole series of things about how they might go about buying the securities. They had to outsource this. They had to interview these people. And so what happened was you know, they still haven't bought any securities in the marketplace because they haven't been able to implement on the basis that which the 440-page uh, document which would require them to. Meanwhile, the banks were falling like stones. And so the Europeans propped up their banks. They didn't take that view. They propped up their banks by injecting capital directly into the banks, which then the secretary used that. But the secretary said we would use that to encourage lending, right? Uh, in fact, nobody really wants to borrow today, to be honest about it. Although, you know, we have, a, we have a good backlog of loan demand. But across the board, generally speaking, you know, car loans are going down. Nobody's buying new cars. So the car loan demand is way off. Nobody's buying money, borrowing money to build new houses. We saw that chart. And so some of the ideas is, you know, the banks aren't lending as much as they'd like. Frankly, the demand isn't there for many of the sectors and I think that's one of the issues that Chris Dodd has. You know, he like, what are we going to do? Go make more bad loans? I don't think that's the issue. So there's not the demand. And so, but you did have to put money in to prop up or to, or to re recapitalize the banking industry. One of the things you could use it for was to acquire other banks. Uh, we're very fortunate. That's exactly what we did. And, uh, and I think it's going to work out. Uh, I think it's going to work out fine. As a matter of fact, the timing might have been good from a national city point of view. I noticed Key's down to six bucks and Citibank's down to five. And, you know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't really know where it is. And so putting together two banks that will be safer than the one in the first place, I think, is better for the communities that they serve. And, uh, they, you know, but now they're, re, they're, they're questioning that strategy. I think over time, I don't think they will. Other questions? Yes, sir. Well, you know that's interesting. We just issued uh, we just issued our uh, our, our S four. Actually, the number for us is less than seven hundred million dollars. 
at what happens. And somebody calculated and said it was $5 billion. Somebody from a firm I never heard of in a town that I couldn't find. Of course, he's in the New York Times. Uh, it says it's $5 billion. And, and we paid $5.5 billion for National City. I, I read this thing in the New York Times. It said we got $5 billion worth of, worth of tax credits. So I immediately ran into the CFO and I said, you know, if we're getting $5 billion back in tax credits, how come the IRR isn't much higher? <laughs> it's not true. When you think it's that good, it's probably not. And so uh, the issue is that it's, it's the time value. But the, real, the real total value is zero or close to zero. The time value of money advantage might be between $500 million and $700 million. So uh, it's, it's a much smaller piece than, than we thought. By the way, you have to lose the money. You have to have the losses in order to get the tax credit. That, that's one thing that wasn't, uh, wasn't found. The other thing is, is that, and this is really something, you all need to learn this. When you're going with a bill for something, make sure you, you label it correctly. Uh, Paulson named the bill the bailout bill. You know, that really doesn't sound that good. We have any PR people here? No PR, no, no, no PR stuff. Uh, Notre Dame's usually pretty good at PR, but anyways, uh, the, you know, the, naming it the bailout bill wasn't the best. If you and, and everyone says they're giving the money to the banks, which is you know that's another term. And, and so if you're just reading the paper, you say, "Geez, they're giving them seven hundred billion dollars. That's a hell of a thing." Actually, they invested. $7.7 billion in us. We're going to pay a 5% after-tax preferred dividend and then give them also a 15% warrant, which, if we do it right, is going to be worth a lot of money. And we will pay the money back because the 5% jumps to 9 in the year after year 5, so we will pay it back by that because 9 is not a good number, 5 is in this environment. So you know, it's, it's about, it's a part of it is about the, about the marketing of the bill. Other questions? No other subjects. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, market, market accounting kind of exacerbated the whole credit crisis problem. I want to know what you think about it. Market to market accounting is a really a complex issue. And to a great extent, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, because it is, it is what your assets are worth. The one problem with market to market accounting is, is that you don't mark to market your deposits. So when you mark to market your assets, you take a credit mark, your expected life of the loan credit loss. You mark that down for that if you expect credit loss. You also mark it for liquidity. And what's happened, in because the, the uh, securities markets are totally closed, is the security, and I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll tell you, uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities, so commercial mortgage-backed loans, with no delinquencies, the liquidity premium has gone from about 150 basis points over LIBOR to 1,200 over LIBOR with no change in the credit risk. So there's just no liquidity. And so when you mark, but for a bank, if you have deposits, so you can actually carry the loans to maturity, you're funded, you should not have to take that liquidity hit because you can hold them. But you don't mark the you don't mark the deposits in the in the mark to market account. You don't mark deposits to market, and so you don't get any value there. So there is a mismatch, and so I think it's a it's caused part of the problem. Caused part of the problem. Who's looking for a job next year? How do you feel about the job market? In the white shirt up there. The, how do you feel about the job market? Do you have to be loud? Uh, it's, it's kind of troubling, but I think Notre Dame is pretty good about helping out. Not. Now, what will you do differently because the job market is soft? Don't know. <laughs> when I was here, we had, you know, we had, we were protesting everything, so uh, it was a very different time, at least from an employer point of view. When I was here, you know, the Vietnam War was going on. The image of the world was is that everybody in America, all the corporations either made napalm or, 
or financed it. I mean, that was, that was what, what they did. And so corporate America was a horrible place. Uh, and so all the corporations had long training programs, long training programs, uh, so that you would visit every part of the company and get kind of indoctrinated into the fact that what the company did wasn't bad. Actually, it was good. Uh, that's not the case today. The students coming out today are more focused than they, uh, than they were before in terms of their education and in terms of what they want to do. Uh, but how would that be different? Is anybody going to change their views on how they're going to market themselves uh, market themselves this year in a soft economy? Or are you just going to do it the same? Just going to wait for the interviews to show up, and if they don't all show up, then, well, I, you know, I'll take another class. Hmm? Yes, sir. Mm hmm Well, I just have a, a I, I will, I'll give you an opinion, but I don't, don't have any facts. Let me, let me do the employee piece first. Every, I think what you, if, if I can suggest something to you, because it's going to be a very tough market for the next couple of years. We probably have, we have unemployment at 6.5% today, the Fed says it's going to 8, may go more than that. So it's going to be a tough job market. But you are absolutely right. Notre Dame is a great moniker to have, and it'll be a big advantage to you when you're talking to employers. But something I think that you, if, you, if I could, to recommend to you is that when you look at an industry, parts of that industry are growing and parts of it aren't. And we'll talk about National City in a second. And so if I were you, I would, if you're targeting an industry, I would pick who you perceive are the winners, and then I would analyze and see what part of that company is growing. And I would market myself to that company in that area. And I'll give you a little example. Now, in the National City case, we're going to put two really big banks together to create the fifth largest franchise in America, deposit franchise in America. What's going to happen? Well, if you look at the two banks, uh, PNC has nothing in South Bend. We're merging with National City. What are we doing? We're acquiring a lot of customers. So in National City, the customer people in National City are critical to us. They're the most important assets, perhaps, in all of National City. So the idea that you're a customer person in that market is really a great place to be because our intent would be to take our products and leverage them in a way that National City might not have been able to, and grow the market. So that's a great place to be. I'll be rather blunt on the other side. We have lots of systems and programmers. National City has lots of programmers. When we merge the two companies, we're only going to have one set of systems. PNC and National City today have two different sets of systems. So when you look at the bank, you got to say, maybe I don't want to go over there and say I'm one of the great programmers of all time because that's not going to be a place that grows. I will tell you one other thing about banking, too, is that banking is changing. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about is what's going on with housing prices and all the rest. How many of you pay your bills online? How many people write a lot of checks every month? Good for you. I still do, too. But anyways, I pay my bills. I'd like to. What's happening in the banking industry, we, we talk about all the laws given to faults and the problems that we have, but people are changing. Customers are changing how they do business. Checks increased 6% a year every year since I think they were invented until they didn't. And when they didn't, they went down 6% a year and 8% a year. They're down 30% in the last three years. Online banking and bill pay, online bill pay, and bill play by cards 
Cards and online, online bill pay will exceed 50% of all payments in 2011. Unbelievably rapid. It's growing at 30% a year. What grows at 30% a year? It's phenomenal. So you've got an enormous amount of change taking place there. Actually, cash transactions are going down 10% this year. First time since they invented currency, I think. Down 10%. So it's really a remarkable change. So when you're marketing yourself, I think you have to look at the industry, see how it's changing, and see who, see who, wins, in that, see who wins in that space. Because I think there's, a, there's tremendous opportunity even within consolidating industries. You had a question about the auto companies? The numbers I see says that to say that uh, the average General Motors auto worker makes $120,000 a year. The average Toyota auto worker makes $80,000 a year. One's in Michigan, one's in Kentucky. You've got an auto contract that, when you include the retirees, is a 50% differential in cost for labor costs. It's not, it's, not, it, it's not hard to imagine what a problem they have in trying to make it work. And uh, so I think the government is trying to put strings. It's very difficult to put strings with the unions. And I saw the union head on there. I don't know to what extent they understand. But that is that a, you, you're just in a very, very difficult place unless you're able to address your costs. And they're not, they're, they have not been able to address costs. So I think it's real tough. But it's two and a half million jobs in this country, and this is not a good time to lose the two and a half million jobs. What other questions do you have with the CEO of a bank today? Yes, sir. Well, I think the future, I mean, you know, we'll get through this. And the outlook, I think, is very, very good. Usually what happens in times like these is that we become much more efficient and people take their best products and their best marketing products and they market those more and they try to not hang on to some of the legacy expense that they had in the past. And so the Americans have been great at that, really great. I think, you know, I think when we get to 2010, 2011, it would be hard to get there. But I think, uh, I think, frankly, it'll be, a, it'll be a stronger economy and we'll be better off. We always are better off for what we do in a recession. In our case, for example, we put together a thing with an outfit in California called IDEO. It's, a, it's an online account. We've patented it, and I, I would recommend people go online and check it out. We have a game. You can play the game with it and what have you. It's called Virtual Wallet. It, has, it actually has a calendar. The calendar you put in your bills, when you put in your bills, it shows the bills on the calendar. If you have money and revenue coming in, you put that in, it actually shows on the, on the calendar. You get, a, you get an email on your phone that tells you when you're entering danger days. That means you have expenses that are coming up that aren't matched by the revenue stream. You can move money to a savings account. You can pay bills, all with the, and then soon you'll be able to do it all with your phone. Now you can do it online. So I think you just have to keep moving. Uh, moving forward in, in terms of your product development, because if you don't, uh, you've got a real problem. We're also the largest electronic bill payer of healthcare payments. We have a thing called Healthcare Advantage that we've built. We keep growing the number of people we have in that business, and it's growing about 40 or 50 percent a year for us now. Very profitable business, and there's trillions of dollars of those payments every year. So it's a really a good place to go. So I think you know traditional banking will continue. But you're going to have, you know, there's other opportunities within banking as well. How about geographically? Well, geographically, we just did a lot. I mean, with national cities, going to be a lot of opportunities. I think we're just going to kind of get that right for a while. Uh, I think we'll get that right for a while. A couple of things uh, that I would like to comment on before we, we wrap up, uh, but I'd like to hear your experience as well. There's George asked, uh, was nice enough to ask me, uh, what kind of a student was I when I was here? And uh, I blushed a little bit, and I was not a great student when I was here. I was okay. I had a, I guess I had a B average. Tom, you, I don't want you to go back and look that up, but I think it was about a B average, right? somewhere around in there, a B average. 
including my second semester senior year classes. I think it was a B average. Uh, it was, well, we had classes on Saturday back in those days. Who has classes on Saturday morning now? Those were really fun. I thought, <laughs> And the the profs that taught on Saturday mornings would, would were also the ones that t- took attendance. It was really nice of them to do that. And uh, you know, back in those days, we had seven thousand guys here and a thousand girls at St. Mary's. And somebody told me I didn't say this, but I'll repeat it. Somebody told well, we're on tape. Anyway, <laughs> it was hard to get a date in those days if you if you said anything wrong. But my son and daughter-in-law went here uh, and had a great time, and, and uh, they've done great. It's terrific that, that the women are here now. It's a, it's a much better advantage, and I can see that in my son and daughter-in-law and, and their kids actually watching how that works. So the school's improved, uh, improved a great deal uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. I mean, I could never get in here, and I'm, I'm honored to be, honored to be a, a graduate of this university. And the university, and back to your point, the university has has taken academic excellence and the business school to to a place that it was never before. And so I'm proud to be a graduate, but you should be even more proud because of the school that you're graduating from is far better than the one I graduated from. But there are certain things that don't change. And when I look back... uh, in my career, and I've got a few years left, but th- there's some things that make people successful, and they don't change. I had a professor when I went to Ohio State. He was a big, arrogant guy, and he smoked a big cigar, which you were allowed to do in those days. He handed out his tax return, and he made a million dollars in 1970. It's a lot of money. He had a lot of side businesses. And the first day of class... Seven o'clock at night, he was puffing on a cigar, and he says, if you miss two classes, you flunk. I don't care if your mother's sick, you crashed your car. If you miss two classes, you flunk. And we all scurried out. We find out this can't be right. We're graduate students. How can this be? I mean, we all scurried out. We found out that's right. If you miss two of Foster's classes, you flunk. And about halfway through the course, he said to us, he said, now you've all found out that's true. Let me tell you why that's my policy. When you get out of here and you get into the business world, if you don't show up, you don't win. You don't get the business. You don't get promoted. You don't win. So if you learn anything in my class, it's about showing up and making it happen. He says, quite frankly, it takes good health to be successful in this world. And I thought back over now 35 years of banking, and, you know, I don't, if I can say, who's been successful? Number one, simply, it's people that show up. If you don't show up, you don't win. I can't count on you. You can't be my teammate. If I can't count on you, we all have, how many people are in the, have case courses and they work as teams. What do you think about a clown that doesn't show up? It's true in life. It's true in life. Uh, you got to show up to win. Sounds kind of doesn't sound too complicated, but uh, the other thing is you have to be a partner. When I look at people who've been successful in our company, when you get into a company, you will be able to perform yourself. You'll be able to identify yourself and you'll be successful on your own bottom for a while. And then you'll get promoted into where you're in charge of a team. And all of a sudden, you personally can't move the numbers yourself. And we have a lot of people who still try and do it themselves. They don't realize that it's only when the team wins will the numbers move enough to matter for them to be successful. Some, frankly, never figure it out. And that's why the Peter Principle is so popular. You get to a certain level and you keep, you keep trying to do it the way you've been doing it. And frankly, that's not how it works anymore. It's about the team. It's about managing larger groups of people and about being a teammate. And that's different. And there's one other thing I think that's, uh, that I, if I could pass on to you that's absolutely critical. And I, I remember, you would remember a fellow named Dave Collins who was a basketball player. 
this fellow ran up and down the court, and he was used to dive for the balls, and it was floor burns or what have you. And somebody said, or the announcer said, that uh, this is a person who doesn't have the talent of the other players, but he makes up for it with hustle. And Bill Russell, who won more championships in the NBA than anyone else, said, that's where you're wrong. Hustle is a talent, and it's the most important talent. I've seen really smart people be successful. I've seen some really smart people not be too successful. I've seen some not-so-smart people be successful. But I've never seen a lazy person be successful. I've never seen a lazy person be a good teammate. I've never seen a lazy person be a good partner. And I don't want a lazy person on my team. And I don't want a person who doesn't show up on my team. And I hope you personalize those things because I'm a guy who's been very, very fortunate. I sat in those chairs and fell asleep. I was okay as a student. I was a good pal to a lot of people. I showed up for all my classes. I mean, I showed up for the classes. I didn't study as much as I should. But I showed up, I learned the people, and I got along, and I learned that it takes hard work to be successful. I got into a company who recognized your efforts and rewarded the efforts. And over time, I was able to partner with a lot of people, and I got very lucky to partner with the right people. And quite frankly, it's turned out great for me. And so if somebody says you're, it doesn't take luck to be successful, they're wrong. When I joined a company, it was the same size as National City back in the old days, it was about $2.5 billion in assets, and the idea that that company would exist and become the fifth largest franchise in America over the next 35 years, nobody could have predicted. But over time, it's worked out very well for me, and it's because of the values that I learned here. We have corporate values at PNC, very similar to national cities where you respect and have high integrity, you respect your fellow employee, you value diversity, you care about your customer, you care about performance. Uh, those are the things that you learn here. You learn here at Notre Dame to respect your peers. You learn to work as teammates. If you don't, it's your fault. But frankly, those values, those values are more important to you and will be more important to you over your career than anything else. I had a boss who later became the CEO, and I followed him, and I, I, he said to me one time, I, he asked me a question, and I started my usual BS, you know, giving him some cockamamie answer, because I didn't know the answer, and he stopped me, and he said, don't lie to me. If I ask you a question, if you don't know the answer, tell me you don't know the answer and go figure it out. But don't lie to me, because if you lie to me, I might go do something as a result of what you told me that was incorrect that will be embarrassing to me. And as a result, I wouldn't be a good teammate, never mind a subordinate to him. So it was very refreshing for me that I learned that integrity all the way around uh, is very, very critical to long-term success. You have to do, people, do business with people you trust and respect. You're a soccer player. You've got to know where your partners are, where your teammates are. You have to know, uh, and that's true with the, whether you're playing playing bridge or whether you're playing any, anything else, or whether you're in whether you're in real life. So it's a uh, that to me is is critically important. Uh, and if you, if you learn anything from this class, it is that you can be successful. All of you will be successful. All of you will be successful if you work hard at it. You put some effort into it because you clearly have the intellect, the training, and if you look at Notre Dame, you adopt the value system that they have here. Now, someone might say, does that mean I have to be very religious? Religion's up to you. But values aren't. Because I tell you, if you have no integrity, I can't trust you, I can't be your teammate, I can't rely on you, and I won't promote you. Then you will fail. It's not any more complicated than that. And so you've got to build on the values that you get at Notre Dame. I think, quite frankly, you'll all do, uh, you'll all do great.
But any, I wanted to make sure I said that because to me in my heart, that's the reason why I've been fortunate to have a great family and I've been fortunate enough to have a great career so far. I kind of wouldn't have banking business, but uh, that's very, very important. What other questions might I be able to entertain before the group? We have a few minutes, but I wanted to make sure I got that one to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll evaluate how the government does um, in hindsight. It'll be kind of interesting. Let me, let me give you a few examples. There, there's a few things that are critically important. One is systemic risk. Uh, let me talk about Bear Stearns, for example. Bear Stearns had $3 trillion of derivatives on their books. $3 trillion. Okay, who's taking statistics? I can hardly remember this, but, you know, you got this bell curve stuff, you know. So say, let's say the derivatives were distributed in a bell curve fashion. So they had a trillion dollars that were positively positioned, a trillion dollars that were at par, and a trillion dollars that were in a lost position. Theoretically, all net positions are collateralized every 24 hours. That's not true. The check is in the mail. They're collateralized every 48 hours. Bear Stearns was going to collapse. The Fed put in money, carried it over the weekend, forced it into J.P. Morgan. Why? Assuming they went bankrupt that weekend, what would you do if you were Bear Stearns? Yeah, I'll tell you what, we would both do the same thing, right? We would take the cash from the positions where we were positively gapped, right? We would take that positive collateral from our counterparty. We'd be okay at par, and we'd default on the trillion dollars where we're in a negative position. We wouldn't put up the cash collateral that was required. The Fed decided they didn't want to find out what a trillion dollars of defaulted derivatives would do as it cascaded around the world. That's systemic risk. That's systemic risk. Same thing with AIG. AIG is the most complicated financial company you could ever imagine. We are not an AIG bank. Never really did much with AIG for whatever reason. I don't know, but it wasn't a company. We did a little bit with them. After they went upside down, we looked at it. They touched, they touched us 27 different places. Not only did they have $447 billion of credit to vault swaps on their books, they're the largest guarantor of, of, of airplane leases. They're the largest guarantor of automobile residual values. They're the largest player in DNO insurance. They're the largest reinsurance player. That, I mean, it goes on and on. And so systemic risk was critical. And so they, they, I think what they have done with the TARP and the capital and the liquidity guarantees by the FDIC and some of the things they've done with the big institutions, I think they've took, taken the systemic risk off the table. The other risk they took off the table by guaranteeing deposits was they've taken the lines in the street in front of banks off the table. So I don't, think, I don't think we have those two issues. Now the issue is how do you get the markets to work again? And this morning, Fannie and Freddie, for example, and we can go backwards. To get here, uh, I gave you a little example of what the banks did. But to get to where we are, there's a whole series of mistakes that we made over a long period of time. A whole series. We, did, we mismanaged and misregulated Fannie and Freddie. Uh, we, we did a whole series of things. We didn't manage hedge funds. There's a lot of things we did that could have done better. But we've got to fix the mortgage. We, we've got to fix the mortgage issue, the value of houses. And I think, quite frankly, we just saw Fannie and Freddie announce this morning they're not going to foreclose. Uh, they're not going to foreclose anymore uh, between now and the end of the year. Trying to keep people in their homes, find out a payment stream that they can make. And then when they can make that payment stream, write down what they can't make and then move on and understand what those housing values are. Uh, that's the piece that the government really has to attack because it isn't until we get there. Uh, and I think they're talking about that. It isn't until we get there that we really understand it. But they had to stabilize the systemic risk, stabilize the banks. I think they've done those, both of those things. Now they've got to work in the markets. Other questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very I think it's a very important issue. 
I think uh, when you look at, at some of the, there's, there's a couple of issues that, that have happened. Some are contractual. You always look at hindsight, you know, and, and to see how it works. Uh, but frankly, some people got paid way too much money to do what they did. The issue, I think, that comes up right now, uh, first of all, you'll always, people always complain about the CEO getting paid what they do. Frankly, everybody wants to aspire to the job. And so what you do is you have a compensation package that people want to aspire to. Because I can tell you what, until you get in the job, you don't know what the job is. Everything that goes wrong is your fault, and everything that goes right is somebody else's. So, I mean, it is, it is a hard job. The average tenure of a CEO in the United States in the New York Stock Exchange Company is four years. It doesn't last long for a lot of, a lot of collateral damage reasons. And so to have somebody to... You know, somebody told me that the best job is the number two guy or the number two woman because then you don't take any of that heat and you can kind of make a good living and do okay. So you, the, the comp is really should be set so that people aspire to want to, to want that job and to go, to go through it. So that's, that's what's important. One of the problems we've had that's, that's, that's really, I think, uh, caused a major issue is that people have set themselves up to make a lot of money put the company in a position of tremendous risk, take the cash, and then walk out the door, and the company collapses. And some of the things that the, there's a term called clawback that's in the TARP financing, and I think that's exactly right. I think if you walk out the door, you get paid. To, there was one executive in, in New York, a number of the executives in New York where, they paid themselves 50 or 60 million dollars in a bonus, and the company collapsed the next year. Now, the only way it collapses the next year is if they put it in a risk position that wasn't sustainable. But they paid themselves a 60 million dollar bonus, and they walked out the door and took the money, and the company collapsed. They didn't deserve the money that they got paid. Uh, because of the because of the risk position they put in, they put the company in. So uh, when you when you're totally tied, without having a broader perspective, if you're totally tied to just earnings, people will do they can do what they want to do to generate earnings, and take risks that you probably don't want to have in the long run. And so you got to be very careful of executive comp. But I so there's a lot written about it. Uh, but there are some clearly some mistakes that are made. And some other cases, you know, hindsight's 2020. You know, so it's, you know, somebody paid somebody a lot of money and gave them a three year contract for a job that nobody else would take. And you needed a really high quality person. Nobody would walk in unless they got guaranteed a lot of money. The thing didn't work. He got paid a lot of money. You know, you can open yourself up to criticism in that case. So you have to take it one off. But, it, but it's, it should be, the risk should be clearly understood in the executive cop role. And that hasn't been the case. Always. Yes, yes sir. People would like to go back and blame the Fed on lowering interest rates. I think they did the right thing. Frankly, we just didn't look at We at PNC looked at risk-adjusted returns when we made our investments and matched our balance sheet. Other people didn't. And so I think it's more on us than the Fed. I think it's more on us than the Fed. And, and where we are today, I don't think anyone could have understood all of these various things coming together this way. Uh, that would happen in, in this in this time frame. So I, you know, it's 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 always good to have hindsight. But that if somebody told me one time, if you find yourself in a really a bad place, which happens sometimes, uh, and you don't think you did anything wrong, it's because a number of things came together in a way that you couldn't have predicted. And I think that's where we are today. What you have to do is figure out how you get out. Don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out how you got here. You can study that, you know, you can have graduate students work on that five years from now. What you have to do is get out of the swamp and get going, and I think that's what we're trying to do. There you are. 
Let me just tell you, thank you, Dean. This is an honor to be here. I mean, it's, it's an honor to be here in front of Notre Dame students who I, I respect more than any other student in the world. Uh, you represent our, the university that I stand for, and, uh, and I've got to applaud what you've been able to accomplish. It's a far better university. You've made it a, greater, a better place than, than I could have ever imagined as I stand in a, in a building that didn't exist. This was a field. This was red, red field, was it? Tom, where's the top blue? I think this was red field. We used to park cars here. Uh, and the, it, it, it's a whole different organization than it is today, and that's because of how great the students are. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. There's something to keep going to see inside. Really, thank you very much. That was it.